Okay, everybody. So now we have uh, our special guest with the invited paper, Veseline. My um, perception that Veseline is more practitioner now, even though with a research background, but they are making really practical tools which are on the market, which are used by companies. So Veseline will tell us about what he has to say, please. So I want to tell you about learning to find bugs from quote unquote problems and some experience for us of us of what worked and what didn't work. So the big code, big code is an entire entire area of making making software that will leverage the massive code bases that solve uh, that that exist, and taking these huge code bases that that are already there of like programs, uh, bugs and fixes and various other data, then we will be able to make a next generation of tools that can maybe write the code on their own, but maybe just fix some bugs, maybe uh, help you help you in discovering bugs or some some things that were not possible before. And the promise is there, like right? there are more than 100 million repositories in GitHub alone. And in general, developer experience is a major battleground for platforms and for cloud providers. Everybody wants to give you a tool that is easy to use and that you make you write software with less bugs and of course that they would you would use their platform for this but uh, that's something that's go of everyone and so new generations of tools are about to appear and it's a big new research area research groups are built basically in all major groups like we did something some stuff in eth jury there are many other universities now participating there was a huge darpa program on finding bugs with machine learning in code. And we have found a company called DeepCode that does this. And DeepCode is now part of Sneak. And we are actually making a tool that is growing like crazy, like being really loved by developers that take it. But so big code is in the research area. And there was a lot of research going on so far. And the first problem that were approached by big code were kind of the easier problems. And by easier, I mean that they are, you don't need to always have the correct solution. Maybe, maybe the task itself is such that there's just no competition because it's completely impossible to do the same thing without machine learning. So for many years, there was code analytics, which was looking at, uh, let, me, let me see a code base and say, if, the, if in this code base, there is something suspicious. Uh, in terms of how things were committed, in what order things were committed. Maybe some, some changes were done very quickly, maybe they will be buggy or something like this. Uh, but then there were the next, the next generation of tools that were actually reading the code and trying to understand something. And so one of the, one of the works that we did there was on code completion with statistical language models. So we published this in, a, in PODI 2014 as a paper. So as you are writing code, you may press the dot or something else. And then it will show you a drop down of things that would complete the code that goes on with according to what was already written. So there are there are very good tools now with machine with deep neural networks that do this. So you can start writing a bit of JavaScript and then it will complete strings, uh, APIs, parameters. So it's already like going quite good. If it does not find the best result, then it can show you like five or 10 results and then you pick the best. Even if it doesn't work, it's fine. It's just helping you type faster. So that's, that's one area that's been very active in machine learning for code. So we did more, like we did type prediction. So there is a tool called JS Nice where you can put code, like JavaScript code, and then it, will, it may be actually minified and obfuscated and once you once you put the code there, it will, it will de-obfuscate it, essentially re reconstruct variable names and types in the JavaScript program. So it will become much more readable than the original program. And so JS9 is still quite used nowadays, although it's a tool from like more than five years ago. And we have done the same thing for binaries and for Android applications. So you can de-obfuscate an Android application. Um, essentially, there is a tool called um, AP. Uh, there is a there is a tool for for making Android applications smaller by taking away classes that are not used, or by renaming all the classes and all packages into very short names like a.b.c or stuff like this. 
And so you can reconstruct this well, like we see from the bytecode of the, of the Android application what uh, is done in, the, in, in every function. And we are actually able to reconstruct the names of these functions, the methods, the classes in the application. And then you can, you can use it as a, as a way of reverse engineering Android application. So these are, these are live tools. You can try them, they work, they go, but they are, they are the easy part of the big code research. In a way. Now, what is the hard part? Like we're talking about code quality, we're talking about bugs, we're talking about like helping you actually write code. And helping you in the parts of the software engineering that take most of the time. And so let's like let's take defect finding, which is finding security violations or finding simple like bugs, something that does not satisfy, or code quality issues in code. Well, in 2001, there was a very nice paper that was finding bugs in Linux device drivers by observing that, well, many device drivers are supposed to be similar. So if nine out of 10 device drivers are doing something and the 10th one is doing something a bit different, very likely it's wrong. So let's just point it out. And um, with high probability, it will be some bug in the device driver. And Obviously, bugs in device drivers are very bad. So it was something as quite successful result coming out, out of it. Well, it's like 20 years later, and now you imagine that it will be machine learning, finding all kinds of bugs automatically and doing stuff. But no, uh, in fact, um, like there are groups at Microsoft Research, at Facebook, at Google, at many other institutions. And like the most thing that we got is what I call anomaly detection for bug finding. And it's not even close to practically usable tools. And I will show like, why is this happening? Like, why is it the case that it goes on? And it turns out that just having large and deep neural networks is insufficient. And there are fundamental problems with the data and the task. And there is plenty of research that's not even competitive to classic techniques. And so, what I want to talk is like what the gap is and how are going to close it and what can we do here. So the first thing is, I mean, I don't want to be pointing and saying, well, this is bad, this doesn't work, and that's gone. In fact, I'm going to take one of the best papers uh, that is doing machine learning for uh, bug finding. It's called Deep Bugs, and it does with 60% accuracy. It finds bugs. So meaning that from the report that it gives. 60% of them are true reports. And the way this tool works is it takes some large training corpus of JavaScript programs. So let's say 100,000 programs. That's the data set that is commonly used called uh, JS 150, so which is K, uh, which is has training and evaluation data. And the training data uh, has this kind of program. So I'll make them as points in the plane. And now we do something very smart. We don't know if these programs are good or bad, whether they have bugs or not, but I know what kind of bugs I want to find. For example, I want to find bugs like I mistakenly swapped two arguments of a function, or I mistakenly put one operator instead of another. Let's say I put plus my instead of minus, or like such kind of simple bugs. And the good thing is that I can actually make this fix easy or may may in easy way introduce the bug in the program. So let's say I have my data set and let's assume it's mostly correct programs. So what I will do is I will manually introduce uh, this defect. So, I mean, I somehow visualize it by like shifting all points a little bit in one direction. Uh, so now my data set that consists of 100,000 JavaScript programs consists of 200,000 JavaScript programs. And some of them are with introduced defect. The other ones are without introduced defect. Well, the next step that I do is I will train some very good deep learning classifier as deep as possible, like great thing that can go. And so if you find a way to separate the green from the red samples. So usually I would get like 90 X percent accuracy on this classifier. And that's what I'm going to get here. Uh, so everything that's on one side of the curve it should be red. Everything on the other side should be green. Uh, of course, you cannot always make sure that everything is covered, but most of the things should be covered. Like you should have like 90x percent accuracy of this classifier. So now I will look for samples 
where the model was absolutely confident that something is a bug, uh, but actually it was in the original data. So that's why I that's how I will find the bugs. So for example, this one, according to the model, is buggy, but I'm not so confident. But for this one, I'm very confident. So this must be the bug. And I say, well, let me report this. And I mean, it does not say it in the paper, but this is all, all an entire area of machine learning called anomaly detection. So essentially, I fit data with some model, and then I find things that completely don't fit my model. So these are these are bugs. And this is this is all great. So now I have a very good deep learning system that can find bugs. Well, I told you that's anomaly detection. Uh, I mean, it does not say in the paper it's normal detection, but that's what it is. And it has its fundamental limitations that, however, of course, if you look at what anomaly detection does, like you have to know about them. Well, so when, when it works, it works if you fit a data to a simple model. And by making the model simple, I can find unusual data. If I manage to make a complicated, good model that learns everything, which is like the pinnacle now of deep learning, and actually it has happened already that some models fit 200% of the data, then I will find zero anomalies. Or even if I find a few things which are misclassified, it will not be the model cannot be confident about them. So really the, the anomalies with very high confidence will be few, but it's good. So it's still okay. Like I can get around 150 reports uh, in this, like if I apply the technique of this work and around 100 of them would be true problems. So this is good uh, still, like it finds bugs. So that's state of the art and it's not bad to like it's like we can we can work on better models we can think of ways to increase this accuracy but this is this is roughly the state like you get this data and then you get these reports uh, of course the problem with anomaly detection is that if you want to put more reports you will get drastically lower accuracy but you can work and like you can still improve the model and the model a bit and so you you still do something well and then there is something I painted the thing a bit too rosy uh, still. Uh, most of the problems are not bugs, but style issues. So I will have 150 reports, 100 true problems. There will be some bugs among them. There will be some style issues among them. So I will not know how severe the thing is, but 100 of them would be true problems. So that's, that's something good that we take on. So now we have things like deep bugs. Uh, they do 150 reports, they do 100 true problems. So this is, this is what, we, what we want to do. So now where is the gap? Like this is, this is where the state of the art of research is and where on machine learning for code. So where is the gap with, with the models? I mean, it's, is it accuracy or something? Well, if I take bar misuse, like the first task of bar misuse, that use gated graph neural networks models, they're even noisier. Like the paper doesn't even say how many things are true bugs. There is a nice sentence that says there were some bugs. And I strongly suspect that it's something like there were four bugs among like 400 reports. But still like it finds bugs. Uh, and this has been improved. Now there is a so-called great model, which is an extension of the transformer model, which is less noisy than bar misuse. And it can find uh, cases where you should have used one variable instead of another variable in the code. So this is all good. Uh, we get 100,000 programs, and then we get around 100 reports. Um, yes, it's anomaly detection. So if you want to get more than 100 true problems reports out of these systems, they would have to report thousands of false positives. Uh, so this is good. So where is the competition? Well, if I take ESLint, I get actually 7 million reports on the same data set. And if I take similar data set for Python and I run PyLint, I get like 1 million reports. So the gap is so big that I don't even need to be doing some very precise measuring here. And in fact, that's what I did. I did some very precise measuring just to, just to see where things are. But now I may have to do research now and I have to do a plot. So let me plot it. Um, so this is what ESLint finds. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not exactly seven million. Maybe it's seven hundred thousand, but it's there, and that's what machine learning finds. 
Um, that's a very big gap that is somehow not being talked. Talked. And so why is it not talked? Well, I mean, ESLint is not a tool coming from the research community. So why should I compare to ESLint? Why don't I compare to some very deep static analyzer that, however, we will report very few bucks? Well, that's what I would do. But uh, maybe, maybe that's the thing. Maybe these models are finding some very unique bugs that you cannot find with ESLint or with PyLint. And that's what I did. Okay, I said, let me get the 100 reports on great. Uh, I mean, we had great re-implemented for Python. So fortunately, I took it for Python and PyLint, but I took the 100 reports. And the answer was no, not at all. Every single of these 100 reports was found by a PyLint rule that was talking about variable life tanks. Things like you assign to a variable, you never use it, you use the value or parameter of a function that was never used or issues of this type. So and were there 100 of these? No, there were like thousands of these. There were 50,000 of these kind of reports um, found by PyLint. On, uh, on the same data set. So that's, that shows that, I mean, the gap is still too big for all these things to go. So do we need some more years and years and years of research? Well, I guess no. So there are two like proposals here to move on. So the first thing is let's pick a real baseline. Like, are we doing finding style issues and bug finding of like not very serious bugs, but like some bugs um, like variable misuses, things like this. Well, let's compare to the real tools that are there. If you're finding security bugs, well, I have not seen a single paper that would compare to a good SAS tool, meaning like static analysis on bugs. Uh, well, actually, there are a few that are comparing on SAS tools, I'll show you. Uh, there are plenty of bugs. It's not that bugs are rare, like 10% of the Java code according to what we checked, well, like the learning deep code on huge amounts of code, does not close files properly. So there is, uh, think of a method that can find many bugs. Um, yeah, there are many of them, so you can go there. Uh, and the second thing is, let's understand the biases in the data. Uh, did I assume all my data is correct program? So the anomaly detection thing, does not work very well because I somehow assumed that my initial training data set consists mostly of correct programs. And then I'm looking for the anomalies in them. So I'm by definition going to find few reports, not many of them. Uh, but maybe maybe I can do something else. Maybe I can I can label a little bit of data and say, well, this data is something that is uh, buggy. And there is more and more that we can go. Uh, well, are we introducing biases? So all these machine learning models, they're based on some data. Um, so there are all the kind of questions. So can I take files from the same repository and train uh, between them? Like, can I, they are not independent if they're from the same repository. And most of the machine learning techniques give guarantees if my training data samples were independent. So there are things that I can do. So for example, if I look at code, uh, I mean, I, what I can do is I can deduplicate things if things are exactly the same, but there are risks. Like if I look at code and let's say I have correct pieces of code and incorrect pieces of code, and they're usually similar. Like a bug is usually very, very small thing. Uh, maybe really I mistaken, I have mistaken plus for a minus or something like this. Uh, so these programs are going to be similar. But there are actually works that advocate, well, I should be removing almost duplicates because uh, then I will make sure that my samples are independent. Well, if I do this, then what will happen is I will not be able to distinguish between buggy and non-buggy programs. So we have to, we have, to have good data. Um, we're still not there all around, but I think we are getting it. And now, I mean, I talked about like what did not work and like what were the what were the main issues. And this was going for 
a lot of works. It's not like one or two things. Uh, it's like majority of the research. And I'm not hoping that somehow this research will stop. There will be still a lot of this research that will be with so big gaps to real tools that it will not be really useful besides making contributions to machine learning models. But still, there are other solutions that we can do. And I would say pre-training is still a very underexplored area. And so what can we do as pre-training? We take a lot of code. And of course, I try to simplify things quite a bit to make it in a picture. But we will not assume that any of this code is correct or incorrect. The only thing that we will assume is that they're coming from this, some distribution. As I want to learn things about this distribution. Well, maybe, maybe the programs are somehow coming like there are some similarities in some way. So maybe I can make some space that's not exactly my original space, but this space now spreads the programs more, more nicely. Now. They, are, they are more like covering this space in a nice way. And so now maybe I can have much smaller data set, which I would label. I will say this is a true bug and this is, uh, this is a correct code, which are both very difficult labels to get. So how do you know that you have covered all the bugs in a program? Or how do you know that something is buggy? Or usually you have to run or you have to get, it's, it's very expensive to get true labels, but I can get a little bit of them. And if I have done a very good job at pre-training, then my model will not just do, try in a random way to separate the good from the bad samples, but it will follow things that I know from pre-training. So that's one area that's still underexplored and like, there will be a lot of things coming in it. And like you can hear up code even with natural language. So there is, there is a lot of potential going on in this direction. And then there is another area in which we actually worked quite a lot, uh, which is let's embed the machine learning inside a static analyzer. But we are not going to reinvent the wheel, like static analyzer is going, still going to exist. And so I will have all my code pieces and inside these code pieces, well, static analyzer, we will find some bugs. So like smart people are making these static analyzers, so they are able to find the bugs. But even, even if smart people are doing the, finding these, these are writing these analyzers, they will not cover every single use case because a static analyzer author will not know every single library, every single way something can be used. And as a result, like they will not find all bugs, I think. But let's say, let's say that I can do something smart. I can see, well, it seems that these pieces of code are doing very similar things. So maybe if this one has a security bug, well, this one is so similar to it, maybe it also would have a security bug. And I will manually check, well, it has a security bug. Okay, I will say true. I will look at this one. Well. It's a real security bug. I'll look at this one. Maybe it will not be a security bug. So that's all good here. And now I labeled a few things manually. And now I want to extrapolate my static analyzer so that it would find more cases where my extrapolations from my learning would hold true. And then I will find more bugs than with the original static analyzer. And we have written two papers that describe different ways to do this. One is by actually helping. Uh, taint analysis. Uh, so it's based on taint specifications. Like if you have uh, taint security bugs, you they are also dependent on things like source and sinks and sanitizers. And we can find more source and more sanitizers and more sinks to get a more uh, to get a better stat static analyzer out of this. Or we have done the same thing for API aliasing specification. So we would find cases where you would pass something to one function, and then when you call some other function, you're getting exactly the same value that you passed before. And so these are ways we can basically improve static analysis. And there are more and more solutions, but these are ones that are much more promising than let's just put a classifier on code. So with this, I mean, I want to leave time for questions, but so the research on finding bugs is going forward. Uh, I want that, well, the next thing uh, will be what we do, deep code, and now at SNCC, we do machine learning augmented static analysis. In fact, we have open positions exactly for this. If you could have interest in both areas, call us. And there are many other techniques that will come. Um, it's a very interesting area. And I think, I think, 
we will get it on track to do much better than what just pure static analysis would do. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was really interesting. I, I actually liked the start of the first part of the presentation where you criticized the machine learning so deeply and you compared this uh, amount of bugs found by uh, traditional tools and machine learning. And my question is, uh, do you think there are certain types of bugs which are more uh, suitable for machine learning tools or machine learning can find any types of bugs? Yeah, that's actually an interesting question. Uh, I mean, there are there are bugs that people want to find in all cases, like security bugs. And in these situations, it doesn't matter whether it comes from static analysis or from machine learning. Um, but so far, machine learning on its own was very, very far from usable on this kind of box. Uh, I believe that it can it can do very well on 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 security box. There was there was a lot of promise for bugs that are completely untaught of static analyzer. There is no static analyzer for them, so machine learning would be able to find these kind of bugs. I have not seen a lot of indications for this, but I would still say that, well, they are, they are the most interesting for machine learning, something that you don't have a static analyzer at all for. At the moment, at the moment we are trying to make static analyzers better with machine learning, uh, which seems to be what, what the market would want even. Do you, do you differentiate between um, style bugs and functional bugs? Or it's the same for you? Uh, yes, we differentiate. That's one of the reasons why, why augmented static analyzer is, is a promising approach. Because if, if I make up a static analyzer for security bugs, and I would make the static analyzer smarter, then I would still find security bugs. On the other hand, if I make uh, things like anomalies or something that just finds, like if, if, if my training data was not giving what kind of bug would be there, then I would not be able to, I would not know whether it's a style bug or, or a true thing um, or, or, or a true defect of some kind. And actually, understanding severity is one of the one of the problems of the existing machine learning tools so far. And I think I think we are able to distinguish to differentiate, however, by severity by what we do. And you think that functional bugs, as you said, true bugs, are more important than style bugs, or some people say maintainability bugs. Uh, yes, certainly they're more important. Uh, in many cases, people would be even a bit forgiving to static analyzer if it would give uh, style bugs. They would say, yeah, maybe it's written in a bit weird way. On the other hand, they would be very unforgiving for a tool claiming that something is a true bug. So this, this means that they would care a lot about the true bugs and don't care that much about the other ones. And one, my last question, what do you think about the possibility for machine learning to fix bugs, not just find them, but do something with them? Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's very promising. So it will happen? Yes, it will happen for sure. We already have something working. All right, that's cool. So we are again over time. So thanks for, for your paper. Many thanks for, you know, uh, uh, coming to us and being at the conference.